The landscape of Etsy is definitely changing and has changed immensely since back when I first started in 2018. The strategies, the tactics that worked then don't necessarily work today. And now moving into 2024, in this video, I'm gonna explain exactly what I would do if I were gonna relaunch a brand for the first time. This is just the nature of third-party selling online, whether it's on Amazon, eBay, if an algorithm updates or something happens or competition arises, right? We have to grow and evolve with the times. And when you're playing in a third party sandbox, there is a set of rules that we have to abide by. But this is just a normal occurrence and we have to know that coming into this game so we don't get disencouraged or get upset when things change because I just wanna set that expectation and that standard that that is normal. That is what you are consenting to when you say, I am going to be a third party seller to somebody else's platform. Overall guys, let's get into what I would exactly do if I was launching a store today in 2024. All right, let's get into it. If I were starting a store today, I would make sure very first and foremost that my brand idea or the business model that I was about to launch, whether it was on print on demand, digital downloads, or physical goods, or physical goods with personalization, or any of those with personalization, I would make sure that the business model had these three attributes. First, that it's trackable. Number two, that it's scalable. And number three is that it's repeatable. So number one is trackable. One of the biggest downfalls or one of the biggest things that I see with Etsy sellers is that they're not building a business model that is trackable or it could be trackable, but they're just not tracking anything. Trackable meaning that every inflow and outflow of money can be recorded and tracked on a monthly basis. So when you produce something called a profit and loss statement about your business at the end of the month, it's actually giving you meaningful metrics on what's happening inside your business. In the upcoming months, I'm gonna be diving really deep into this topic because I think it's something that a lot of people try to avoid and there's just not a lot of information out there on it, but don't worry, I'm gonna have a whole playlist, just like I how I have a whole Etsy ads playlist dedicated to Etsy ads and getting your Etsy ads to profitability with a maxed out ad budget. I'm also gonna have a whole playlist dedicated to internal analytics with your Etsy shop. And I think that the reason that this gets so overlooked in the Etsy space specifically is because the nature of selling on Etsy is pretty low barrier of entry. And so brands or sellers come into the space just kind of wanting to dip their toes in the sand and overlook some of these core fundamentals of what it means to run a business. Personally, I don't like that approach of coming into any business with this idea that it's just a side hustle or like I'm going to kind of half ask it to see if I like it. I know that is it's a legitimate approach to start starting a business, but I personally don't like that because when you come into business kind of already looking for loopholes or workarounds or ways to get rich quick, even though you might not want to admit that to yourself, you overlook again, simple things like building a trackable business model so that you can make data-based decisions about your business, or it's just annoying and we want to avoid it. And so we tend to avoid it and <laughs> focus on only the things that we want to focus on and yeah, that's just not good. But I'm definitely guilty of it too. I'm not saying like I haven't done it, but we definitely wanna know that this is one of the core things that make our business engine strong. The next attribute is making sure that the business is scalable, meaning at any given time, if I got a huge influx of orders, would I actually be able to fulfill those orders in an unembarrassing amount of time? If you're somebody selling physical products, print on demand and digital downloads don't really have this problem, but if you're selling physical products, this is normally a problem from a product of that type of business model. So if you're selling physical goods that take you weeks to make and fulfill, right, then that means that as more orders come in, it's going to elongate that fulfillment time for you. And while the product itself might be amazing, it's just not scalable. And again, these core attributes are gonna to contribute to you being a competitive shop on the platform moving forward, right? When Etsy first started many, many years ago, that was okay because there just wasn't a bunch of competition, but now there is. So we have to make sure that that we're shooting for our shops to be scalable. And what I'm not saying is maybe if you just don't have the raw materials to make the product and now you're back ordered, that's one situation. But if it's just a matter of making sure that you have the raw material and then you can turn that raw material into your actual products in a good amount of time, then that's okay. What I'm really talking about here is if the compounding influx of orders is compounding your fulfillment turnaround time where it can take over a week, two weeks to actually ship the actual item. And the third attribute is 
is repeatable. So you have to ask yourself, is every part of my Etsy business engine repeatable? Because to be scalable, eventually, if you wanted to get into the later six figures or seven figure mark, you're going to need help, right? So that means that every part of that business engine from customer service, research and development, fulfillment, PPC, Etsy ads, social media, follow up, all the things that go into that business engine is actually repeatable where you could remove yourself from it. So again, if you have a really difficult product to make where you cannot eventually one day train somebody to replace you in making those products or launching new product opportunities, right? then we might want to steer away from those product opportunities. Now for print on demand, digital downloads, normally there's no issues there. You can always find a designer online. You can always find somebody that wants to do customer service that even can help package and fulfill your orders, right? Those are really easy things to outsource. I'm really talking about here. If you have a super hard product to make where basically every single product that you're making can be customized in any single way that you want and only you have the skills and the know-how to actually be able to do it, right? You have to be able to have systems in place that are repeatable and trainable to somebody else. Now, just off the bat, those are three things that I would make sure that are just standard attributes that I have that exist in my shop. And what I would wanna do is analyze the marketplace and have a really tough conversation with myself and see, do I actually have the capacity to compete with these other top shops? Do I have the capability, the skills, and the capacity to meet or beat the guys that are at the top? Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to come out the gates with better, everything has to be perfect and better than them. I'm not saying that because that would just inhibit you from starting. But if you know that you have the willingness and the capacity to make that your goal, to strive for that, then I would say for sure, go for it. Again, out the gates, that might not be the case because there's just so much learning that goes into it, but at least you understand the standard and you have the mental mindset that you're gonna go after it <laughs> to make that your goal eventually. A lot of times what my clients will do is they'll give me back three to five five examples of middle tier or even sometimes lower middle tier people claiming that they're their competition. And what we want to do is look at people who are actually performing at the top. So actually selling similar products with similar value propositions. If you're trying to go into jewelry and you're telling me that your competition is selling solid gold jewelry, but you're only selling fast fashion jewelry, right? That's like comparing apples to oranges, right? Those are two completely different customer avatars. Now, if it's your goal one day to sell solid gold jewelry, that is okay, but you're not launching with solid gold jewelry. So I want to see who is your competition performing at a really high level, selling exactly something that would attract the similar similar customer avatar as you. And so, like I said, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll give me back some middle tier shops. An easy way to actually find your real competition that you want to emulate is by simply going into a tool like E-Rank and going to all the shops that opened up in the last year. So if you put 2023, cause we're only in January, right? And you sort it by who's getting the most sales and then you select what niche you're in, right? You can go and look through these shops and see who's pushing the most sales volume in the shortest amount of time and analyze what they're doing. And those are the people that you want to emulate. Those are the people that got in the earliest, but are pushing the most sales volume. And that becomes then your standard. And the danger in picking middle tier or maybe old season shops as people that you want to aspire to be like is because, you know, maybe they'll have not really good imagery, but it will trick you because you'll be like, well, why does this listing have 20 add to carts and a bestseller badge, but the imagery is not that good. And then you're going to start setting your expectation. Oh, well, I can go into the game today and produce similar middle tier marketing for my business. But again, those are opportunities. Those are not standards. The standards come from who has gotten in the earliest pushing the most sales volume because that's what's working now. The variable there and the danger there of looking at seasoned seller shops is that, you know, that huge variable of time, right? That listing could be six years old and have hundred reviews on it because it popped off at that time. But the time variable is the key thing here and really looking at who is my competition competition now doing the best amount of sales volume. And then we want to analyze what are the things that they're doing. So price point, their actual marketing. So the type of imagery, videography, the storytelling that they're doing, their product variation. So in their drop down menu, what, how complex a variation do they even offer for 
their offerings, their quality. I would even go as far as purchasing from a few of your top competitor shops to experience the whole buyer experience of that product. See their packaging, see the product insert that they use, the call to action on their product insert, and collect all of that data before you actually go to market. The third thing I do that doesn't really apply to people that are doing print on demand and printful is build something called a SKU system. A SKU system for POD people is something that's already built for you because when you integrate your products from Printify or Printful and you put your listings onto Etsy, it's already pushing SKUs for you, which is great. You want SKUs. But if you're just selling digital downloads or physical products or physical products with personalization, one of the biggest mistakes that I ever made was that I built a store with over 200 listings that was comprised of over 600 variation options and I had no way to track on a variation option level what I was actually selling. And the way that we solve this is actually by producing something called a SKU. SKU stands for stock keeping unit, and it's a unique identification code that we put on each variation option to identify that that is what is being sold. Without a SKU, you really have no idea what you're selling outside of just going into your sales and physically trying to look at what is selling the most on a SKU level. SKUs do a lot of things for your store outside of just helping you identify what you sold. It also helps you with inventory problems and tracking a huge expense, which is your cost of goods sold. Actually, I'm building a free SKU generator right now that you will be able to get for free to help you make your SKU. What a meaningful SKU actually looks like for your store. Another key thing to note here is that your SKU code, if you were selling, let's say this simple gold necklace, say I sold this necklace in this 16 inch gold necklace in four other listings, we would just wanna make sure that we're using the same SKU across all the listings that are selling this same exact product type. So a 16 inch, two millimeter gold necklace would have its own unique identification code. And I'm actually building a software right now that is going to solve all of that problem for you and be able to show you meaningful reports on what's happening on a SKU or a variation option level. And the software that I'm launching is called Profit Tree. And this is actually the first time I'm publicly announcing it. But but yeah, it's a, the first ever real-time profit tracking solution for your Etsy shop. And if you wanna get your first month completely for free, make sure you sign up for the wait list down below. The link is in the description. But at the very least, like I said, the one thing that you could be doing now is at least giving every single variation option a skew. This also contributes to your business then becoming trackable. The fourth thing that I would do is really not overlook the investment of money or time in the creative marketing component of my business. I would argue now more than ever, your imagery, your videography, and the storytelling that you do with your imagery and your videography is one of the most important things when it comes to selling your products. I would even argue that it's more important than SEO and keywords, because I swear to God nowadays, their AI thing that they have going on knows what your product is, just based off the image alone. Now, don't misconstrue that. That doesn't mean keywords and doing keyword optimization properly is not important. If you are trying to decide, should I spend money and time in keywords and SEO versus imagery and photography or mockups or my digital downloads and the creative part of that, I would say I would put more emphasis on the creative side of things and figuring out how to sell the best in that imagery to stand out compared to everyone else. Since obviously they're looking at the image before they're reading anything, I can promise you that. A lot of times what I see is that sellers like to blame the downfall or not getting the results that they want on SEO, right? SEO meaning the keywords that you're putting in your titles, your tags, your descriptions, your attributes, and your category that you chose, right? A lot of people like to blame it on that because that is a relatively easier problem to solve than looking at the inner workings of your photography, your mock-ups, all the things that actually take higher level thinking on the creative side of things. And if you're somebody that doesn't come from a creative background or never learned how to use a camera, right? These skills take time to acquire. My photography for my first brand went on in month one versus a year later after I've taken thousands of product shots, right? Completely changed, right? My skill set by doing that over thousands of times over, you know, evolved and grew as I evolved and grew, right? So give yourself a break. It's something that takes time to acquire if you're somebody that has fundamentally never worked on the creative side of business before. And finally, number five is prioritizing my product launches. So sometimes when we launch for the first time, we just wanna go out and kind of launch whatever. That seems like it looks good. But we only have so many hours in the day to work 
on launching new things. So what I would do is make a list of say my 50 best case scenario products that I'm gonna launch and I would prioritize which ones I'm gonna put dedicate my time and energy to first based off the best case scenario outcome based off of some data and research. So similarly to how we did our competitor analysis and looked at the top performing shops, we also wanna do the same thing for the top performing listings in the shortest amount of time that are comparable products to us, right? And we're, what we're looking for is a mix of okay, what products actually compare to us that are pushing a good amount of sales volume, right? We can do this with tools like Everbee and E-Rank and Sales Samurai. And obviously we're gonna wanna prioritize those listings that are pushing a good amount of sales volume in a short amount of time. But then also we wanna maybe go a little bit deeper and look at the actual keywords that we're using. So in a previous video, you know, we found a listing that was selling this green scarf. And then we did some keyword research and we realized that the main keyword that was a, a keyword product fit, but also a best case scenario keyword was thin wool scarf. And it had an insane amount of search volume, but very little competition. So if I was someone selling scarves, so I would prioritize launching a thin green fringe wool scarf and make sure that that long tail keyword, it was at the very beginning of my title. And maybe you focus on launching 10 different colors of that scarf before moving to say something like chunky wool scarf, where it has a still a good amount of search volume, but not as competitive as thin wool scarf, right? And so I would prioritize my product launches based off of the best case scenario based off data and also what I have the capability to actually produce. And again, the reason being is because you only have so many hours a day. So I would, again, schedule out your launches or work on those products that are, you know, hopefully the best case scenario outcomes for the time spent instead of just blindly kind of launching things that, that you think look good or, oh, wow, this, you know, listing has 20 add to carts, but not really investigating further on what are those best case scenario keywords and also that time variable of how old is that actually listing, right? Because if the listing is, you know, six years old, right, then we're playing against that time variable where maybe that, you know, it's not actually the most competitive listing. It just has that time variable on its side where it's a six year old listing, you know, that has made consistent sales. Overall, guys, if I was getting into a Etsy in 2024, these are the mega things that I would pay attention to when I'm first launching for the first time. Guys, I have full playlists in my channel about Etsy ads, about <laughs> hiring and firing employees, business theory. There is thousands of hours of information in my channel for you guys to check out. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and cue any of the videos that I had in this video next, because they are going to help you, especially as we're entering this new stage of e-com in 2024. And especially if you're just starting out your business for the first time. All right, guys, I hope to see you again. And yeah, I'll talk to you later.